It is my greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker today uh, for, to our first Timos Colloquium of 2022. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we love to, to make this first colloquium in person, but still uh, the situation doesn't allow us to, to do so. Uh, however, it is a, it's a great pleasure, really, because Michael Johnston, uh, who is our speaker today from the University of Oxford, has actually joined us in, in person in, in Canberra, in Australia. It's our first uh, partner investigator visiting Timos since the start of the center. So it's a very exciting time. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Jagadish to introduce Michael and his talk today. Yeah, thank you very much, Dragmir. And uh, so well, welcome, good morning to all of you and a happy new year. And uh, as uh, Professor Vagamir Neshe mentioned that uh, Professor Michael Johnson is the first uh, PI visiting us in the center. And uh, let us hope that it's the beginning and then there are many more uh, PIs will be visiting us. And uh, Professor Michael Johnson is a professor of physics at the University of uh, Oxford in the Clarendon Laboratory. And then he is the head of the, uh, the Terahertz Photonics Group uh, there. And then he has got strong association, of course, with Australia. He was born and brought up in Australia did his bachelor's degree and PhD degrees from the University of New South Wales. And uh, so we have been collaborating with Michael for a long time. And particularly Michael has got strong association with the AANU, starting with one of the summer scholarships in our applied mathematics department and uh, uh, measuring the surface forces and the wettability of surfaces too. And of course, he's got a strong background in optical spectroscopy, ultra-fast optical spectroscopy and uh, wide variety of optical electronic devices. And uh, so then uh, he's been particularly making uh, enormous amount of contributions in the field of uh, terahertz science and technology. And uh, Michael is a fellow of the Australian Institute of Physics and also Institute of Physics UK. And also that uh, both the uh, Institute of Physics UK and Australian Institute of Physics, uh, UK gives a prestigious medal called uh, a Harry Massey Medal. And then he has been the winner of the uh, Harry Massey Medal recently, and that's been a really great honor for his uh, contributions to the field of physics. With that, and uh, he's going to talk about nanowire-based uh, devices for terahertz polarimetry, and then I will uh, hand over the floor to Mike, Michael. Thank you very much, Jagadish and Dragomir, for the very kind introduction. Um, I, I'm really delighted to uh, give the first uh, Timor seminar um, this really means a lot to me, and um, I'm really delighted to be here in ANU again after nearly a three-year break, which is a really long time for me to have been outside Australia, actually the longest time I've ever been outside Australia. So, um, and th thanks very much for the introduction. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is nanowire-based devices for terahertz polarimetry. Uh, in doing so, I want to first give a bit of an introduction to um, oops, yeah, an introduction to uh, the terahertz part of the electromagnetic spectrum, then talk a little bit about what, how this is useful for uh, probing the electrical properties of semiconductors, and then go on and tell you about a really nice collaboration with um, ANU and uh, University of Strathclyde, where we've developed a really unique uh, sensor, terahertz sensor, which is based on semiconductor nanowires from here in, in ANU. I think it's, it's kind of a nice example as well of, of what um, can be done within T TMOS, um, showing the collaboration, international collaboration and collaboration between different universities within um, Australia and in this case, the UK as, as well. And I'd like to say again, how excited I am to be a partner investigator um, on the TMOS um, uh, center. So what, I'm, what, what I'd like to just say a little bit about just an introduction to my group to start with. Uh, so my group's based at the Clarendon Laboratory in, in Oxford, and we work on really three, three research themes. Um, one of them is terahertz spectroscopy and charge dynamics. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, today. The other one is terahertz technologies and devices, which is what I'm going to have the focus of the talk on today. And the other area which I'm not really going to talk about today is on vapor deposition of metal halide um, perovskites. And we've been doing some work for um, nearly for about 10, 10 years now 
in that area and um, develop the first um, efficient you know, planar heterojunction uh, solar cells based on that system. Um, and the, the technique um, we use is uh, still not widely used um, in, in the field, but um, I think this, this is a growing, growing kind of area. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that today. So let's have a little bit of an introduction to terahertz spectroscopy for people that uh, may not be familiar with this area. Um, firstly, well, we all know the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, what I mean, what I define by the terahertz um, part of the electromagnetic spectrum is that kind of range between uh, microwaves and infrared light, uh, which we typically divide, define to be about 100 gigahertz through to about um, 10 terahertz. And this is actually a particularly interesting area of the electromagnetic spectrum for a number of reasons. Um, one, one reason is that uh, uh, wireless communications is rapidly approaching the lower end of this, this part of the spectrum. So this is potentially uh, commercially interesting. Um, but being a physicist, the area that probably I'm, I'm most interested in is um, spectroscopy in this re region of the spectrum. And it's a phenomenally interesting area um, in semiconductors and a lot of uh, molecular systems. Um, so for example, in semiconductors, there's a lot of uh, correlations that have typical energies of the photon energy of, of, of terahertz photons. So for, for example, one terahertz is about four milli electron volts. Um, and that kind of energy scale uh, corresponds to correlations such as exciton binding energies, um, plasmons, um, uh, Cooper pair binding energies in superconductors, um, and um, yeah, phonons in, in semiconductors uh, as well. So it's, it's a very, very spectrally rich uh, region. And until about 20, 20, 20 or 30 years ago, um, it was relatively under um, investigated. Uh, to give you an idea of the kind of wide variety of uh, research areas where terahertz spectroscopy is interested in interesting, uh, we've got plasma diagnostics um, and uh, condensed matter physics. I talked a little bit about correlations, excitons, phonons, plasmons. We can also look at um, uh, the conductivity properties of semiconductors, which I'm going to talk a bit about uh, later. Um, chemistry, it's a range of lots of um, uh, uh, gas rotations and you know, collective uh, vibrations in, in molecules. Um, and, you know, it can be used for uh, more kind of industrial processes, for example, in quality control and non-destructive testing. There's also uh, been a, a lot of work on medical imaging using this part of the electromagnetic spectrum as well. And really here, I've just jumped on a few uh, areas uh, of uh, application. Okay, uh, just as a little bit of an introduction, it's quite quite amazing to think that, you know, only in 1800, um, we really didn't know much beyond the visible part of the spectrum. And this is a lovely paper um, by William Herschel, um, the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society from 1800, um, where the infrared part of the spectrum was actually discovered. And it's a, it's a, it's a really nice um, kind of experiment. And um, of course, we are going a lot further into the infrared, um, but it's, it's just interesting to see how, what, what you can, um, you know, by exploring a little bit more of the electromagnetic spectrum, suddenly you, you, um, you, you learn a lot. Um, so the experiment, basically was um, a, what we'd call these days as a bolometric experiment. So um, Herschel basically had a prism against the window, a slit in the window, and then dispersed um, the different colors of that light out using the, the um, glass prism. And what he discovered was, and, and then he was looking at the different colors using thermometers, so a bolometric detection system, and being a good experimentalist, you can see that there were three thermometers there. So um, rather than just measuring with one, he had two thermometers which were sitting um, in the different colors of light, and then a, a control thermometer which was just measuring the room temperature. Um, nice experimental setup. But what he noticed, he was basically looking at the different um, 
thermal um, properties of the different colors of light. But he took this platform here, and you can see the wheels there, uh, outside um, the red part of the spectrum. And he noticed there was still a difference in temperature between these two, these two thermometers and the other one. And this was the really discovery that there was something beyond the red part of the visible spectrum. Uh, and it's, it's a nice, it's nice reading the papers actually from that that time because they're quite flowery in the the English and I particularly like the uh, having lately had some favourable sunshine and obtained sufficient uh, and obtained a sufficient confirmation of the same uh, da 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 um, so you know the experiments relied on sunshine um, which in England is not always a, an easy thing to to come by so um, we wonder how long that experiment actually took to to uh, to undertake. So if you're worried about MOCVDs down and things like that, just imagine having to wait for the sun to come out. Right, so we've talked a bit, little bit about the terahertz or far infrared part of the spectrum. How do we actually do spectroscopy in that part of the spectrum? Now, um, what we do in general is a form of, rather than dispersive spectro spectroscopy, so Herschel had his prism, it's a dispersive form of spectroscopy, what we tend to do is time domain spectroscopy. And the most commonly known form of time domain spectroscopy is the Fourier transform infrared spectrometer. And this is basically a Michelson interferometer. And instead of dispersing the light in a medium such as a, a prism or, or using a grating to, to spatially disperse the different, different wavelengths, um, you basically produce an interferogram, in this case, using a Michelson interferometer. However, we do a slightly different form of time domain spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy because in Fourier, Fourier transform spectroscopy, what you're always detecting is the intensity of light. Okay, so um, the intensity of light down here, you can see E star heat E. So we're losing the phase information as such. What we do in terahertz time domain spectroscopy is we measure electric field versus time, which means we keep all this phase information. It makes it a little bit easier to extract things such as electrical conductivity from semiconductors. So, um, and that again, brings us back to some kind of historical uh, research. And I, I like to, think this is the first real example of an experiment very similar to um, time domain, terahertz time domain spectroscopy. And this is an experiment by Heinrich Hertz um, from uh, 1888. So, about, so 88 years later than Herschel's discovery of uh, infrared radiation. And what, what he did here was produced a spark gap uh, in this region here. Um, between these two. So there's basically a high voltage generator, spark generator down here, and then produced a spark between these two electrodes, got some antenna type structure across the side here. And that emitted a very sharp electromagnetic transient in the, probably in the radio frequency range, and was transmitted through free space. And he detected that there was a electromagnetic transient traveling through free space with a antenna detector. In this case, it's a loop of wire with a small gap. And so what he saw was when he generated a gap between this region here, the, a, a spark would also form in this gap region here. And this is in a way very similar to the type of uh, time domain spectroscopy we do. We might produce a um, terahertz transient from a photoconductive emitter sitting here, travels through free, free space, and then we might detect it with a um, photoconductive terahertz detector. So in a way, this is the first type of experiment of, of time domain spectroscopy, although we weren't really doing any spectroscopy here, but it was an example of electromagnetic radiation traveling through space. Okay, so enough history at the moment. Um, let's have a look at how we might use terahertz spectroscopy to look at the electrical properties of semiconductors. Now, uh, I think uh, many of you will be familiar with semiconductor nanowires, and this is a nice um, experiment from way back in 2012 from the Lund Group, 
where they were measuring the electrical properties of a single um, nanowire here, and they produced a Hall bar across the nanowire to try and work out ability and, and carrier concentration properties such as that. And now this is, of course, a typical way of uh, looking at the electrical properties of a planar semiconductors is to put down a Hall bar and do um, a Hall measurement. The issue with nanostructured semiconductors and particular things like nanowires is being able to actually produce a Hall bar on the nanowire. And I think this would not have been easy. Um, I'm no expert um, in e-beam lithography, um, but this is not, not easy. So if you wanted to actually characterize you know, many nanowires produce statistics or, you know, very, have to provide very fast feedback on electrical properties of nanowires after a growth run. Um, this is probably not your technique for doing that. The other issue is it's not easy making good electrical contacts to nanowires, one, because of their geometry. And two, if you're looking at new material systems, you have to work out how to make good omic contacts. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to, you know, directly measure all those properties that you could measure with a hall measurement, but not have to put the contacts down, and be able to really um, not disturb the system you're looking at in extracting the electrical properties. And that's where our non-contact terahertz probes come in. So this is an example. So if you think about trying to um, measure the uh, conductivity of something like a nanowire or even a, a bulk wafer, um, if you're working in DC, um, you're very familiar with the, um, the, uh, the Druder conductivity. Um, you you know, apply an electric field, measure a current, and then you can work out what the conductivity is. And then um, from that, go back and extract things such as mobility. However, if you actually apply an alternating um, uh, bias or, or current, if you like, across, across your, your sample, um, then you actually can obtain a lot more information about the system. And this is what's known as an AC conductivity measurement. So in the case of um, the Druder conductivity, the AC conductivity follows this Druder expression show over here. And um, what you would expect the, um, and so we can actually measure what that conductivity is as a function of frequency because a terahertz, single cycle terahertz tr transient has a very, very broad um, spectrum, which covers you know, maybe from about 30 gigahertz through to maybe three, three or four terahertz. And so we can measure that conductivity as a function of frequency. And that's what's shown by the dotted points here, the blue dots being the real part of AC conductivity and the red parts being the imaginary parts of AC conductivity. And then we can go and fit that say with the Druder conductivity expression. And that's what we've done here. The solid line is the, um, the solid lines of the, the fit to the Druder expression. And this is a measurement actually on an N-type bulk gallium arsenide wafer. And you can see this beautiful agreement between the measurement and the Druder expression for AC conductivity. And the um, crossing point between the real and imaginary part here is one over two pi, the relaxation time. So it's the momentum scattering time of um, electrons in, um, in, in uh, gallium arsenide, which you can very quickly go back and extract what the mobility is from that. Okay, so we can show that we can work out, you know, the electrical properties of um, gallium arsenide bulk. What about nanowires? Okay, so shown over on the right here, um, we've got the AC conductivity spectrum of a series of um, endoped um, gallium arsenide nanowires. And you can see that the spectrum looks quite different from the bulk wafer. So um, zero frequency, which would be our DC conductivity, got a finite value for the um, gallium arsenide wafer, as you'd expect. However, for the nanowire, you can see the, the DC conductivity, zero frequency here goes to zero for the real uh, part, as well as imaginary part. And the reason for that is because of the limited extent of the nanowire, you basically drive electrons and holes into the ends of the nanowire. And um, so you don't see a DC um, component to, to, to current when you apply an electric field. 
that system. As you start alternating the electric field, you can see that you get a resonant peak um, sitting there, some resonance, and this is basically the plasmon resonance in that system, and then that drops off again. So up until the, um, the plasmon resonance there, we've got what's known as a capacitive response in that system. So if you're an electrical engineer, you call that a capacitive response. And then beyond that, um, that plasma resonance, um, it looks very much like the Druder type thing. And this is an inductive response. Yep. So in the case of the wafer, all we're seeing is an inductive response. The nanowires, we're seeing a, a capacitive response up to a certain frequency and then an inductive response. Now, if you were just looking at one frequency component here or just the DC frequency component here, um, you would you wouldn't get very much useful information. But actually by looking at the full spectrum here, we're not just getting a value out for something like mobility of the semiconductor. What we're also doing is we're learning something about the um, actual system we're looking at. We, 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 we can see the plasmon resonances. We can see that there's a plasmon forming in that system um, here, but not in here. So we, we're really learning a lot more about the system than just doing a DC um, type measurement. And we're also doing this um, without having to put contacts onto the system. Um, how we actually do this type of experiment, um, this is a terahertz time domain spectrometer shown here. Um, so I'll just stop that for a second. Um, so basically in terms of nanowires, we typically disperse those on a um, some form of transparent substrate, usually quartz or sapphire. And then um, we usually, um, in, in the case of uh, the, um, the uh, spectra I showed you on the previous, previous page, we just had um, some doped nanowires. So we just shone a terahertz probe through and then extracted. So we basically did the lower experiment here and we just shined a terahertz probe through, um, measured the terahertz probe uh, going through a um, substrate without nanowires on it, measured the terahertz probe going through with the substance of this on the substrate with nanowires and then compared the two and then we could extract that spectrum. However, what we're often interested in is looking at charge dynamics as well, or trying to work out, say, what the mobility is in a um, undoped semiconductor. In that case, we inject charge carriers and we do that with a um, laser pulse, usually femtosecond laser pulse, photo inject charge into our nanowires in this case, and then we can measure the AC conductivity spectrum at an arbitrary time after photo excitation. This is very, very neat because it allows us to measure the AC conductivity spectrum, um, not just in the equilibrium state, but also as a function of time after photo excitation. So you can look at the evolution of uh, charge carriers as a function of time after pulsed excitation. And the way we do that, oops, um, is shown here. And um, basically we do this all with femtosecond laser pulses. We use one to generate a single cycle terahertz transient that is shown onto the sample sitting here. And you can see also a beam coming in first, photo exciting the sample. And then what we do is we use a third laser pulse to read out electric field versus time um, of the terahertz pulse. And then, so basically we've got a, we produce some form of two-dimensional data set, um, which we can then uh, measure the AC conduct or use to extract the AC conductivity at various times after photo excitation of the sample sitting there. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this is the type of data that you would extract from the experiment shown, shown um, on the animation on the previous slide. And what we've got here is electric field as a function of time. This is in time in peak seconds. And um, this would be what the probe would look like going through the sample before the optical excitation, or before the ejection of charge carriers into the ensemble of nanowires. So we call that um, the electric field, terahertz electric field off, meaning the lights off. So this is a dark um, terahertz um, transient running through. So we measure that. Um, and the other thing we measure is then the difference between this dark um, electric field transient, terahertz transient, and transient after photo excitation, well, 
after photoexcitation, a particular time after photoexcitation. So, for example, this trace here shows a change in electric field from that associated with charge injected 250 peak seconds earlier. Okay, so we get that little data set there. You can see that's much smaller um, electric field. So, this is a change in electric field. Now, this is just one time after photoexcitation. Of course, we can do this for many times after photoexcitation. And um, that data down there is just this line along here. So this basically is the um, these data sets for lots of different times after photoexcitation. This allows us to follow the evolution of the AC conductivity as a function of time after photo injection. And, um, and you can look, you know, can look at a slice also, for example, along the peak of the terahertz transient, and this will give you some indication of the um, the uh, frequency averaged conductivity as a function of time after photoexcitation. You can see a sharp rise when the laser pulse hits, and then a, a decay as a function of time after that. So that's basically just following that dotted line along here. From those raw data. We can then extract the full AC conductivity spectra. And this is shown here, the real part of photoconductivity, imaginary part of photoconductivity as a function of frequency along the x-axis here, and if, as a function of time after photoexcitation along the, the y-axis there. And then the color scale is the value um, of the conductivity, both real in that upper plot and imaginary in the lower plot. It's often easier to look at um, these color scales, color plots by taking slices through them. So if we look at a slice, the AC conductivity spectrum of 25 uh, peak seconds after photo excitation, uh, 500 peak seconds after photo excitation, and a nanosecond after excitation. What you can see is this uh, plasmonic type response, as we expect from nanowires. Um, but if you look carefully, what we see is that the, the plasma resonance um, shifts to lower frequency as a function of time after photo excitation. And this makes sense basically um, because the, um, the plasma frequency is proportional to the square root of the, the charge density in that system. And as time goes by after photo excitation, charges start getting, start recombining. And so the carrier density drops and we can see that in the dynamics here. By doing detailed analysis of these type of um, spectra um, and fitting them with this, um, uh, with, with, with a basically Rensian oscillator model um, based on um, the, the uh, plasmon in these systems, we can extract many, many properties of semiconductor nanowires that we've shown um, some years ago that mobility, charge carrying mobility can be extracted. Um, and then more recently, um, doping density, charge carrier lifetimes, surface recombination velocities, um, donor binding energies and um, for, and we've looked into specific charge scattering measurements as well. So this has been a very long-term collaboration with the ANU here, going right back to, to 2007, using terahertz spectroscopy to really help us understand the electrical properties of nanowires. Um, okay, so those measurements were all done uh, without magnetic field, but what we can also do is apply a magnetic field as you would do in a standard Hall measurement. And then you can generate even more information. So, of course, what we were just looking at previously was we applied an electric field in one direction or generated current in one direction, and then we measured um, the terahertz transient um, in that direction too that well, it's been transmitted through. But of course, as soon as you apply a magnetic field, um, even in an isotropic system, semiconducting system, um, you're going to get a rotation of the um, charge, the, the current from the direction of the applied electric field. So um, we can no longer say there's a proportionality between the direction of the current and the applied electric field. Instead, we have to treat this, the, the, this proportionality instead of well, the, the um, conductivity, not as proportionality, but we have to treat this as a tensor. Okay, so we've got a vector electric field, um, which we're applying to that system. This is coming from the, the incoming terahertz uh, transient. Um, and we're measuring the current essentially in that system. And that um, current density vector 
um, need not be pointing in the direction of the applied electric field. So we treat the tensor, conductivity tensor, the, ten the conductivity there as a tensor. So going back to our Druder relaxation time approximation, um, we can get a very, um, a, 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 we can get analytic expression for what we expect the photoconductivity um, tensor to look like in a um, Druder type system under an applied um, magnetic field. And uh, this gives us a very simple kind of uh, tensor um, where omega C here is the cyclotron frequency. Now we can directly measure this. And this is an example of some measurements we did last year on um, a indium antimonide epi layer. And we basically applied a uh, terahertz transient, linearly polarized terahertz transient. Uh, and we first photo excited the sample like we, we, did, we talked about before. So injecting charge carriers into indium antimonide, this is nominally undoped indium antimonide. So we had to generate some charge carriers with an optical pump. And then at various times after op the optical excitation, we probed the AC conductivity tensor of that system. And that basically, if you look at the, the, the raw data, you start off with a, if they've got the magnetic field turned off, you see a reasonably linearly polarized terahertz pulse here. And in the case that you switch the magnetic field on, you see, so we've got Y component of electric field in that direction, X component in this direction, time running along here. But in the case of, oops, when you turn the uh, magnetic field on, suddenly you've no longer got this linearly polarized terahertz pulse, but you've got something that looks relatively circularly polarized um, pulse going through there, which is basically a reflection of electrons in this system um, ex exhibiting cyclotron orbits around the magnetic field, which is in the K vector of the, um, the K vector direction of the uh, terahertz pulse. So it's kind of a beautiful um, uh, um, uh, example of a cyclotron resonance in a semiconductor, which you can really, really visualize as such. Again, um, we can look at the um, AC conductivity spectra. And of course we can do this in any of these, well, in, in a, a range or any of these tensor components. In the case here, um, this just shows the expression up at the top here, shows the expression for generating or going from the raw data to generating the uh, XX component of the tensor, of the conductivity tensor, but we can just as easily display the um, YX component. All the data is stored um, um, in, in our raw data. All, all, all the information is in our raw data to um, extract all the different tensor components here. Um, and, but, but here we're just going to show the um, XX component. And again, down this side, um, let me see if I just, okay, that's better. Okay, so um, what we've got here uh, is, as I said, we're looking at an indium antimonide epilayer, it's four Kelvin in this case. Um, we look at the AC conductivity spectrum, 200 picoseconds after photo excitation. So we've still got some charges hanging around in that system, but it's long enough that the charges have cooled. Um, so that's why we chose 400, I'm choosing 400 here. And this is no magnetic field. And we just see that beautiful kind of Druda response that we saw before from the, uh, the uh, N-doped gallium arsenide wafer. But this is a Druda response from the photo-injected charges in an indium antimonide wafer at four Kelvin. We start turning on the magnetic field, so the middle middle plot here, you can see that the spectrum has changed quite significantly. And again, the dot dot, the points are the measured data and the solid lines are the fit to our expression over here for the conductivity tensor. And if we increase the magnetic field a bit more, uh, uh, okay, so, um, okay, so this is, this is basically the same magnetic field, these two, uh, but what we've done is change the carrier density in that system as well. So you can see a change in the cyclotron resonance in this case associated with um, the um, charge density in that system. So at much lower charge densities, you've got less scattering in that system. You can see much sharper um, cyclotron resonance in, in that, that system. What 
what by fitting this expression to the um, experimental data, we can extract things such as the relaxation time, um, as well as the effective mass, a component effective mass tensor. Um, and this is really, really useful. Um, so look for, from those data, what we can look at, this is just looking at the frequency average um, XX component of the conductivity tensor as a function of time after photo excitation. Those points are showing the ones that I showed the spectrum of on the previous slide. Um, and from, ex from the, the, the spectra, we can extract the effective mass, which is the red corresponding to this side. Um, and then we can also extract the relaxation time times the, um, the carrier density in that system, which is corresponding to this side. What you can see is a very, very sh sharp change in the um, effective mass or the average effective mass of charge of electrons in that system as a function of time after photo excitation. So we're time resolving the cooling of electrons in the um, conduction band of um, indium antimonide. And we are essentially here probing the non-powerability of the conduction band of indium antimonide. So this is basically, we're observing the cooling of the charge carrier distribution um, in indium antimonide. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of why we might be interested in using uh, terahertz spectroscopy for um, looking at semiconductors and a little bit why we might be interested in understanding uh, or being able to measure the polarization state, the full polarization state of semiconductor, of, um, of, uh, of a terahertz pulse. So now we move into what we might be, how, how we've uh, developed a device for doing just that. Okay, so, uh, as we've seen previously, most terahertz spectroscopy to date has been done with linearly polarized terahertz pulses and detecting a linearly polarized terahertz pulse after it has passed through a sample. But you know, some systems um, we are interested in. So for example, if we're looking at an isotropic material or as the case I've shown previously, if we're looking at um, a Hall type measurement on a semiconductor, um, if you just look at one polarization component, you're mo missing a lot of the information. And as it turns out, a, by, if you can record the full polarization state of a terahertz pulse, you've got a huge amount of information. So what is the polarization state of a particular single cycle terahertz pulse? Well, of course, if you Fourier transform a single cycle pulse, you get a very broad spectrum. So how do we define that polarization state? Well, the way we have to do that, and one way of uh, visually representing that is to display it on the Poincaré sphere. So this is a bit like the, the block sphere if you're familiar with two level systems, um, but this is for right and left hybrid polarized uh, light instead of spin up and spin down electrons. And the way we would def um, be able to describe a certain polarization state is actually a trajectory across the Poincaré sphere. Okay, so the Poincaré sphere, we might have right, purely right-handed uh, sexually polarized light at the North Pole, purely left at the South Pole, um, all the different linearly polarized states along the equator, and then all the elliptically polarized states around the rest of the surface. But for a single cycle terahertz pulse, each different frequency component um, could have a different polarization state. So we have to basically represent the polarization state as some trajectory across this, um, this, this uh, uh, spherical surface. So a huge amount of information in the polarization state of a terahertz pulse. Um, we've talked a little bit about why we might be interested in um, or measuring the polarization state of terahertz pulse. We've talked about semiconductors. Um, there's other areas, including terahertz birefringent imaging and improving the resolution of standard terahertz imaging. Um, and then there are future applications, for example, um, vibrational circuit dichroism of biological systems and even possibility in, in, in terahertz communications with um, increasing the amount of information we can encode um, on our terahertz pulses. So what have we done in this area? Um, so in particular, we've used nanowires to make um, a range of different uh, devices that um, manipulate and measure polarization of terahertz pulses. Um, 
One of these works, this was a, a joint work between um, ANU, Hannah Joyce's work, uh, Hannah Joyce's group in Cambridge and us in Oxford, um, is we developed a um, broadband, um, very fast uh, picosecond switching speed uh, terahertz modulator. And this is a very special modulator because it's basically a polarization modulator. So you can switch uh, very quickly, um, switch the polarization state of a terahertz pulse um, by photo exciting an array of aligned nanowires in that system. What I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of the talk today is some more recent work that we've done. Um, and this is a collaboration between ANU, Oxford, and Strathclyde um, on actually implementing single nanowires in a terahertz detector, which allows us to detect the full polarization state. And this is a really nice example of what we can do with nanowires um, that is not, has not been possible with planar type semiconductor structures because we're using that three-dimensional uh, quality of nanowires in the, the fabrication process. So there's been many attempts to um, produce uh, terahertz um, polarimeters, basically being able to measure the polarization state of terahertz pulses. Um, and these have involved things like using wire grid polarizers. Um, and uh, we, back in 2005, developed the first uh, multi-contact photoconductive terahertz um, detector. Um, so there's a photoconductive receiver, and this is again a collaboration between ANU and Oxford at that stage. Um, then, more re then, then a little bit later, the work was done with fast rotating wire grid polarizers. Um, and then, as I mentioned briefly, we, we did some work with a photo activated terahertz modulator to increase the speed. And then, um, very recently, uh, we've developed this monolithic uh, cross nanowire terahertz detector, which measures the full polarization state um, in general a lot better than these other techniques. Okay, so what do I mean by photoconductive receiver? Okay, so basically, if you've got a free propagating electromagnetic pulse, so this is the thing a bit like um, when, when, when uh, with uh, Heinrich Hirsch's experiment, you saw the, that loop of wire and um, measuring the, the pulse arriving by a spark. What we're doing is, again, we've got a loop of wires. Essentially here, we've got two electrodes on a semiconductor and we've got the electric, uh, the single cycle electromagnetic transient coming in between these, these electrical contacts. Um, but we um, do something a little bit more tricky than, than um, Hertz did. Um, what we do is we switch this antenna structure, this detector on and off um, by photo exciting a semi-insulating semiconductor which sits between those electrodes. And the trick is that if the solid line here is a terahertz transient, um, we photo excite at some instant of time on there. And if the photocarrier lifetime in the semiconductor is very short, we essentially just measuring electric field point at one point on the terahertz transient. And we repeat this experiment many times. And then it looks like there's a DC uh, electric field across this gap here, and the current flows in that circuit. We measure it. Um, there's some subtleties with how this works. I'm not going to go into that in detail now because we've uh, got limited time. Um, but it suffices to say you don't need um, a very, very short charge carrier lifetime to be able to do this detection method. You can actually use a semiconductor with a longer lifetime. And then there's various tricks with tuning the lifetime of the semi the charges in the semiconductor to be able to optimize the signal to noise ratio. Okay, so this was the original multi-contact um, receiver we developed um, back in 2005. Um, it worked, um, but it suffered from um, problems um, in terms of um, the antenna structure was non-optimized for coupling the electromagnetic pulse terahertz into the antenna structure. And you can see the small gap regions here that you photo excited. The other thing is you had to be very, very careful with photo exciting um, these gap regions very, very uniformly. Otherwise, the um, sensitivity of the um, detector to horizontal and po vertically polarized terahertz transient 
um, would change. So it was very sensitive to alignment. Some other groups went on to four contact design. We actually came up with that idea um, and tried it first, and didn't really like it because there's massive crosstalk um, between the um, electrodes or the antenna structures here. So it's very difficult to extract um, or cleanly extract what the polarization state of the terahertz pulse is. I'll show you a, an example of that in a second. Okay, so what we did was we developed a photoconductive antenna and we're using bow tie type antenna structures, which are very good at coupling. So one, one set of bow tie antennas here is very good at coupling um, the electric field in this particular direction. And the other set is very good at coupling the other direction. But the problem with the four, four these type of design previously was that the region in between here was um, all semiconductor. And so you photo excited that you could have crosstalk between these two and these two and these two. And what you really want is just electrical contact between those, that pair and this pair. And we could do that with nanowires because we can suspend the nanowires in free space and have these top two nanowires here electrically isolated from the bottom ones down there. And we make a detector which is absolutely free from crosstalk. And we're also making a very, very compact terahertz detector, not like um, rotating wire grid polarizers or large you know, systems where you split out and do electro optic sampling. The nanowires um, were grown here um, at ANU using selective area apt epitaxy. We used indium phosphide nanowires um, and we characterized the um, photocarrier lifetime in these systems using the technique that I introduced earlier. And then we did a, a process these into the devices. And this was a combination of uh, work by um, Kun, Kun Peng in Oxford um, and Antonio Hurtado's group in uh, Strathclyde. So we had samples going back and forth. So um, Kun did the uh, photolithography on these systems and Strathclyde group positioned these nanowires using um, their nicely, um, their, their beautiful transfer printing technique. So we started off, they positioned two nanowires, couldn't, um, it, um, did EV lithography and evaporated. Um, but the antenna structure contacting the first two nanowires, these samples then went back to Strathclyde, the next two nanowires were positioned on top, air gap between them. And then um, samples went back to Oxford and then um, couldn't did the final uh, layers on top of the electrodes and contacts of the device. And this is what the device looks like. Um, you can see, you know, this is kind of millimeter scale um, structure. Um, and if you zoom in, um, we've got about a four, four micron gap between those electrodes. And you can see there's about 10 nanometer nanowires in a hash pattern sitting on top. So, um, how do these work? And it turns out they worked rather nicely. And this is an example of the raw current that was recorded by the detector. Um, and on, on the y-axis here against time um, in the x-axis. And the, we were simultaneously measuring the horizontal and vertical ch channels of this device. And you can see if we applied the, the linearly polarized terahertz pulse, um, at zero degrees to the this axis of the uh, the detector, you got no signal from the vertical channel and a significant signal from the horizontal channel. And um, then, uh, if you um, look at electric field, which is basically um, to, uh, a very simple um, transform from the raw data here. You can see the single cycle electromagnetic transient just being horizontally polarized here and no vertically polarized um, case, as you would expect for a linearly polarized terahertz pulse. We can also express that in terms of a spectrum over here by taking the Fourier transform. As what we then did was rotate the, um, the uh, terahertz, um, the linearly polarized terahertz emitter around 30 degrees. You can see now the vertical channel coming in um, rotated around 45 degrees. Now you can see roughly equal horizontal and vertical components, and then around 90 degrees. And now we've just got the, the vertical 
component and no horizontal component. So this is beautifully detecting the polarization state, in this case of just a linearly polarized terahertz pulse. Um, I was going to say, what was the problem with these four contact ones on bulk semiconductor? And the answer is lots and lots of crosstalk. So um, if we did a measurement, um, okay, so this, let's look at the lower trace here to start with. This is our nanowire detector. And this is the radiation pattern for the horizontal and vertical, the horizontal and vertical components of the, um, the terahertz transient. You see the beautiful um, antenna type pattern that we would expect for this system. And this is essentially showing us a zero crosstalk of our device. Okay. Um, if we did do exactly the same experiment, except with the four contact um, detector, you get lots of crosstalk between these different channels. And, um, and it even changes whether you measure simultaneously or separately the two channels. Okay. And very difficult to um, extract any useful polarization information out of that type of detector. Okay, so we managed to detect down to the change in linear polarization down to less than a degree, um, but this is more limited by the polarization purity of our source than the detector. What we then did was actually, rather than just looking at linearly polarized lights, let's look at something really exciting. And this is something exciting for TMOS as well. And hopefully uh, uh, you can also come up with really, really neat ideas um, uh, in, in this aspect of the work, we looked at a, a terahertz metamaterial, and this was a previously pub published material, so it wasn't um, exciting from the, the, uh, the metamaterial um, side, but what we wanted was a model system to be able to characterize our detector. And so the model system we looked at was a twisted split ring resonator pair um, on a quartz um, substrate, and Kuhn fabricated this structure. And it was designed as a polarization um, converter, polarization rotator. And again, what we did was we shone a linearly polarized terahertz pulse at this uh, polarization converter. And then we detected, we sim simultaneously, we, we detected the full polarization state um, after it had passed through um, that metamaterial. And of course, we can simultaneously detect the horizontal and vertical components of the electric field, which allows us to recover the full polarization state um, of the terahertz pulse. And if you have a look here, um, this is a, a SEM of the uh, fabricated uh, metamaterial. And we're just zooming in here, looking at this um, twisted split ring here. And the top plot here is a um, FTDT simulation that um, could be performed on this, this structure. And so what we expect the um, to be the transmission for the horizontal and vertical components of the electric field shown by the solid and dotted lines here. And then, um, as you can see here, this is what we actually measured. These the shaded regions are the errors, um, standard errors on the measurement. Um, but you can see quite nicely that we very much reproduce the features um, that we expect uh, from, the, from the calculated um, uh, response of um, the metamaterial. So this is a nice example of um, that the detector is working in a real, um, real system. Okay, so I think I've just about run, run uh, my time. So, I, I mean, I, I really want to particularly acknowledge um, Dr. Kun Peng, um, who's, who put um, many years of work into this, this project um, and is, uh, it's, is, has been really fantastic. Um, so she did her PhD um, here with um, uh, Fulan at um, ANU and then came on to Oxford. Um, Fulan and actually Patrick Parkinson, uh, who is now in Manchester. And um, then she, she joined us in Oxford as a, as a postdoc. Another you know, nice example of this uh, Oxford ANU um, uh, collaboration and interlink. Um, interlinking. Uh, I'd also really, you know, like to thank uh, the um, everyone at, at ANU for, you know, who've been involved in this work and um, the, the, all, all the many collaborations we've had uh, over the years. And on this project, I also really wanted to thank um, 
um, uh, Dimitas um, uh, at uh, University of Strathclyde and um, Antonio Herrado and um, um, Michael Strain and, and uh, Martin Dawson. And um, I didn't talk too much about the Telehertz Polarizer stuff, but that was collaboration uh, with uh, Hannah Joyce's group at the University of Cambridge. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of an introduction in the type of stuff we do at Oxford and also maybe some ideas of future collaborations within the TMOS remit um, that we might be able to do. Um, in particular, I think the, um, this polarization resolving um, detector may be interested, interesting for um, uh, characterizing and understanding new ideas um, in metamaterials. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Michael, for the exciting talk. And uh, the, uh, we have heaps of questions from from Ilya. I, I don't know if I can switch Ilya live somehow. Uh, I would ask Mary if she's able to. I don't seem to be able to find to switch him live. Uh, otherwise, I will I will read the first question yep. from Ilya. Uh, thank you for the presentation. A couple of basic questions about the plasmons in non-wires. I think this is the first part of the talk. Yeah. Uh, what is the typical wavelength of the plasmons in the non-wires at uh, one terahertz frequencies? How does it depend on the non-wire diameter? And does having non-wires of different diameter uh, length broadens your spectrum? Yeah, so, so um, the, the, the plasmons are really along the length Along the length of the nanowire, so um, they are some that they, they, they are relatively um, not influenced by the diameter um, of the nanowire, but they they are influenced somewhat by the length. Um, so the diameter is not such an such an issue. We've actually been doing some work um, with with uh, with um, Suda in in Monash, kind of modelling. Uh, the the effects on these, but but in general, um, it, it's not a strong dependence. Um, it's certainly not not a strong dependence on the diameter of the nanowire. They they really look like wire antennas at these wavelengths, um, and there is a small influence on the length. Um, but we can take that into account when we're we're actually modelling those, those those systems. Hey, <laughs> thank you. They let me talk. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Ilya. Yeah, uh, thank okay. you. Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, then I'll just ask the uh, drug. Are there other questions in there? Because I'm not sure. Because I, I don't want to. Ilya. Please go ahead. Okay. So <clears throat> your time domain signals from this polarization sensitive detector. It's so you show pretty short time span, up to three picoseconds, yep. and it keeps growing towards that point. So why, why is it growing? And it's typically just uh, goes up to the maximum and then it goes down and it keeps oscillating, but here it keeps growing. Yeah, okay. So, so what we're looking at here is, um, is, is current and mm -hmm. it's actually an integrated current. Okay, so this is what I didn't go into in too much detail. So the processed one here is basically, this is essentially the derivative. So, so this plot here is essentially the derivative of the current data here. And why that is so, I'll just go back to that thing I didn't explain here. Um, just let me clear. So can you see my mouse? Yes. Yeah. So um, the, it's, the nanowires are actually an integrating detector. So what, what actually happens is um, at a, for a particular um, delay between the um, terahertz pulse and the readout optical pulse that photo excites our, our nanowire detector, um, you switch on the, um, the conductivity of the nanowire. And that conductivity stays on um, for, if you have a look at- uh, Okay, I think I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> if we just go down to this, you can see this stays on for, you know, over, over a nanosecond, well over a nanosecond, the, the conductivity stays high. So basically what we do then is we collect all the integrated current that's being driven through that circuit, it's being driven forward and then it's being driven backwards and we integrate that, okay? So that's why the, you know, any asymmetry in this pulse then will lead to an offset in the integrated current that we measure. And so that's basically why um, you see this going up there because it's still integrating 
as a function of time afterwards. And there's uh, probably, as you can see, this, this more closely represents the electric field. Um, there's a little bit of a wiggle in this pulse um, at later time, and that's associated with this feature here. So if, if you keep on going here, it will probably just stay, well, I'm sure you couldn't have the data, it will, it will probably stay up here um, because there's a slight asymmetry. You see the, mm -hmm. the area up here in this pulse is larger than the area down there, so that will stay above. It's just the asymmetry in the poles. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Ilya, you have one more question, but I would like to, to uh, first uh, get a question from Annette. Uh, Annette, you can mm -hmm. unmute yourself and ask it directly. Oh, yes. Um, hi there, Mike. Um, hi. I was wondering how um, compact is your, um, your detector system? Um, in the sense that, like, could we squish one into um, the IR beam line of a synchrotron and use it as a detector there? Yeah, so these, these, these are actually very, very compact. Um, so the, the whole detector size is only um, a couple of millimetres by a couple of millimetres, and it's on quartz. Um, you do need to, of course, get the, the, the current out. So. Um, we usually try and put a pre-amplifier, not, I mean, at the moment we've got them sitting inside a vacuum box and then we've probably got a, a meter or so of cable going to the outside and then we've got a pre-amplifier on the outside of the box. Um, it's a bit better if you can get, you know, it, it, rather than having 20 meters of cable or something before the pre-amplifier, it, it, it's better to get the pre-amplifier closer, but the detector itself is, is very, very small. And yeah, I'm be just wondering because um, uh, terahertz yeah. detection in uh, um, in synchrotrons is typically done with a bolometer. Um, so, uh, but I know that um, obviously various beamlines around the place are trying to look at uh, ways of detecting polarization, um, usually using the Y grid polarizers. Now, I was wondering. You know, could this be advantageous? Yeah, so, so um, the, the trick is to get the synchronization with the laser pulse. Um, people have definitely done this um, with accelerators, um, but they, it generally requires, um, you know, using a um, amplified laser pulse to um, seed the electron bunch. Um, and then, uh, then, yeah, then, so that you can get the electron bunch and the um, the the excitation. Exactly right. Yeah. So, so, so they, they basically need to be in sync with each other. So this has been done with conventional, uh, um, you know, terahertz detectors, um, electro-optic sampling, and also with um, with photoconductive receivers. Um, so if, if the synchrotron is set up to do that, um, this detector can basically be put straight in. So, so it's, it basically can replace a standard um, terahertz detect photoconductive detector in pretty much any terahertz system, as long as it's capable of um, having being able to simultaneously measure two channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice to uh, <laughs> good, Ilya, good, you good had catch one up. More yeah. question yeah. in the chat. Ilya. Yep, <clears throat> yep. I just wanted to ask one more question. If Possible since nanowires are so small, it's sort of natural to think. Uh, can you integrate this detector into this near field terahertz detector? Yeah. So um, this is this is what um, we're currently very interested in doing. Um, we, we mentioned it a little bit in the paper that this was one of the the, the, the possibilities there. So um, I've I've got a an EPRCC fellowship at the moment, and that's one of the things we're we're, we're planning on doing is um, trying to integrate this um, with um with I, I mean with with more near field type systems so yeah it it's 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 definitely an exciting area um and uh it it, it still requires work um but um it's 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 certainly a possibility sorry it's just the continuation of this question i was thinking like in near field you typically we have we want to measure all three components of electric field because it's a very complex near system. Can you think of a geometry for your probe to make it three dimensional? <laughs> I mean, I, I think on PowerPoint, it's quite possible. Hmm. Um, whether we could, 
position. I'm, to, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, the fabrication is non-trivial on that, uh -huh, I would say. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's already tricky. I mean, we, we're essentially already getting that third dimension, but getting the height required, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, yes, p possible with PowerPoint engineering, but would really require some thought um, with an with a near field probe, but um, yeah, some finite extent in Z direction, right? So yeah, yeah, getting that finite extent in a Z direction is 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 the difficulty as such. But you know, nanowise, you can certainly you could certainly do that with positioning the nanowise. It's the structure that then supports the nanowire and the antenna structure, um, which would require some thought. But certainly, if there was kind of a need for that third dimension, that would be an interesting area to explore. Mm -hmm. Well, but certainly not possible in any other way uh, to, to measure it. Uh, 3D polarimetry, so it's very exciting. Yeah, no, no, that, that would be, I mean, maybe that's a nice Timos uh, little collaboration. Uh, Michael, we have one more question from Jenny from Cambridge, actually. Jenny is also visiting a new. Jenny, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. One is about the material selection, because we do have a very wide range of nanowire materials uh, available across Cambridge and ANU. So I wonder if they, uh, I'll put it this way, for the structures we are making here, if we choose different materials, will that change the results uh, significantly, or it is yeah. mainly the geometry? Yeah. Um, so um, in particular, on the slide, we're looking at um, here, by, by, by changing the nanowire material, you can tune the, um, the photocarrier lifetime in that system. Um, that will tune whether you're going, say, from an integrating detector to a detector. So if you use something like gallium arsenide nanowires, the lifetime can be much shorter. Um, then you move to a more direct detector. Um, and by changing the, the lifetimes, you can play a little bit around, bit around with the signal to noise ratio as well. So the, the really nice thing about using nanowires in the system is you produce one wafer of SAE nanowires. Um, you, you, if you hit the parameter space spot on, you can make the thousands of detectors with nominally identical kind of response functions for them. The, in terms of different um, material systems, one of the areas we're most interested in at the moment is moving into in-gas based um, detectors because a lot of um, commercial terahertz spectrometers these days are working with fibre lasers out beyond one micron. Um, so the indium phosphide um, based and, it, and gallium arsenide based detectors that you developed previously are not so suitable out there. Um, it, likely to be some advantages of using in gas as well in terms of um, better uh, lower contact resistance and things like that but um, obviously the materials are a little bit more tricky um, to work with um thanks thanks michael and my second question is actually regarding about the device itself so i assume that cross nanowire device the cross the two layers of nanowires they're totally separate they're not in touch with each other at all right that's exactly right so basically we built up the gold layer um, so that they, they don't contact at all. What if they do contact each other? You're gonna get you're gonna get crosstalk. And it's not gonna it, it'll look it probably won't look as bad as that. Uh, but it will start it, it, you won't get this beautiful radiation pattern that we get from the um, crosstalk free detectors. You'll get something that looks more like that. It won't look that bad because you get massive crosstalk between these these different uh, um, electrodes, but um, yeah, it will, you, you, you lose the um, polarization detection purity if, if they touch. So it's really important they don't touch. Okay. So does matter the distance, like, like the distance between these two layers of nanowires, does that distance matter? Okay. So the, do you mean the, the gap distance here? Uh, the gap distance between the two parallel nanowires and the gap between uh, the two layers of nanowires. Yeah. Okay. So um, the the, the gap distance here doesn't, so between the parallel nanowires, the gap distance doesn't matter too much. You, you want to avoid too much shadowing of the lower nanowires, which is why we've got some form of gap there, but it's, it's, um, it's non-critical. Non it's basically, um, that's, that's, uh, that doesn't, doesn't really matter. The gap distance um, um, in the Z, Z direction um, doesn't matter as long as they don't touch. 
yeah, so we just want to avoid they just have to be electrically isolated um we, we have you know you you, 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 you you want a bit of uh, freedom so that uh, you know you, you don't want too close uh, them too too close because you know some slight change in processing and they'll touch. So, but um, it's 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 irrelevant as long as um, they're not touching. Jagadish, did yeah. you have a question? Oh, Krishna Meyer has got a question. Maybe you can ask him to do that first. Yeah. Uh, uh, put Krishna in the Krishna. You can speak. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. My uh, doubt is regarding the material selection. So there are a lot of research going on with uh, detect detector detectors based on 2D materials as well, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what what is more advantageous in terms of nano by using the nano wires, uh, yeah. or in fabrication wise, or in the uh, current wise, or signal to noise ratio wise? Any advantage of using the yeah. nano wire than 2D materials? Yeah. So, so in this this particular case, um, we okay. So the, the three fives we can get pretty high current densities into them, and we can also um, they've got very high mobilities, um, and the um, which of course you get high mobilities with the two D materials as well. Um, but getting the current density that we get through these um, devices is probably more tricky. Um, the other issue. In particular with this device with the 2d materials is that if you had for example a 2d material um, over the top here over the top of the other ones um, although um, it's fine with photo excitation because you'll get a large amount of the optical beam through and photo exciting both the top and the lower one the terahertz radiation will be basically reflected or or absorbed by the top layer and you won't get a, a good current response from the bottom layer. So we're very much here using the um, 1D nature of the nanowires to avoid shadowing of the lower detector. So avoid shadowing of terahertz radiation on the lower detector. Um, the other thing by having these 1D wires versus a sheet is that um, we know from uh, many um, spectroscopy studies of, of nanowires is that um, we essentially even even though we, we might have in, in the, this case, maybe I'll go through to a better diagram. So even in this case, you can see we've got these, these top nanowires sitting in here, um, which should be shadowing the bottom ones from terahertz radiation. Um, because of their, their, their geometry and their terahertz response, if you've got the electric field going in the opposite direction here, there's essentially no interaction with these wires if the terahertz electric field is running in the opposite direction here. Whereas if you had a 2D material here, you could drive, drive current in the other direction as well, and that would absorb some of the terahertz radiation and affect the response of the lower nanowires. So that's basically why we're concentrating on um, nanowires in this particular detector. But I agree there's a lot of interesting work to be done um, with um, 2D materials, particularly semiconducting uh, 2D materials with terahertz sensing. Thank you. Jagadish, did you also want to ask? Well, Michael, very nice talk and uh, thank you very much. And uh, so question to you in the early part of your work, you've shown the beautiful you know, electron dynamics and semiconductors and determining the band structure and various things. And I was wondering what have been the challenges in terms of uh, studying the whole transport and then uh, learning more about the valence band structure? Yeah, so, um... That's that, that's that's a very very good point. Um, and what what we're basically limited. Okay, so what we're always sensitive to is the most mobile charge carriers in in the system. Um, the neat thing about using the magnetic field. Okay, so in in standard um, measurements where we're not applying a magnetic field, it's very difficult for us to tell the difference between electrons and holes. Basically, we can't. Um, we generally, so for example, in something like indium antimonide or gallium arsenide, we know from the band structure that the, um, the mobility is going to be very, very much higher in the case of whole, uh, electrons than holes. Um, so we can assume the response is pretty much all from um, the electrons. However, in other systems, such as the other system we work on, metal halide perovskites, there's much more of a um, similarity between the effective masses and mobilities of electrons and holes. So we're always kind of looking at an average across an electron population and the whole population um, when we're doing standard terahertz time domain spectroscopy or 
standard optical pulpitary probe spectroscopy. If you apply the magnetic field, of course, we can then separate out the responses um, from the electrons and holes if we can recover the full polarization state, which is why it's really useful to have this type of type of detector. So um, yeah, so it is possible, um, but only by having the full polarization resolved AC conductivity spectrum to extract the um, different response of the electrons and holes in that system. In the case of indium antimonide, again, because there's such a large difference between the uh, electron and hole effective masses, uh, we don't really resolve any response in these data from holes. But on a system where they were a bit more equal, or if we increase the sensitivity um, a lot more, um, you should you should be able to um, separate those two out because, of course, the um, cyclotron orbits are in different directions in that system. Okay, thank you. And uh, Michael, in view of time, maybe we can uh, we can stop here. And I would like to thank you very much again for for us visiting us in in, in Timos and for the wonderful talk uh, that you just presented. I would 